Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Walrus Leadership Forum, Women Leading Through Crisis, presented by Husky Energy and supported by Shaw Communications. I'm Jennifer Allett. I'm the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we are thrilled to be joining you virtually because it allows us to bring people together from across the country. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on in Toronto, to Toronto. I'm coming to you from the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Piton First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Toronto has long been a meeting place for Indigenous peoples and we're honoured to carry on a tradition of conversation. What I'd like us to do right now is just take some time to reflect, for you to think about and reflect on the land that you're on, the moment in history that we're all in, and the larger work of reconciliation and social justice for us all. Thank you for joining me for that. The Walrus started 17 years ago. It was an optimistic project to tell stories and foster conversation across Canada. And we recognize that these conversations are complex, but they're necessary. And for us at the Walrus, they take many forms. We do it through fact-paced journalism with the Walrus print edition and also online daily at thewalrus.ca. We do it through our podcast, The Conversation Piece, and in our public event series, The Walrus Talks, which is now the Walrus Talks at Home. And no matter where the Walrus is or how people connect with us, we are committed to bringing together interesting and interested people to really create a better Canada. So thank you for joining us today and being a part of this conversation. At the Walrus, our award-winning independent journalism, our fact-checking, our national ideas focus events, it's all powered by our donors, our supporters and partners. So thank you all for being a part of it. And again, to Husky and Shaw for making this event possible. Now, to give you an idea of what to, what to expect ahead, after this welcome, we have the keynote, and that will be followed by a Q&A and then closing remarks. So if you submitted a question when you registered, thank you for doing that. We got it. And if you'd like to submit a question during the event, you can do so over Zoom. Or if you're tuning into the YouTube broadcast, you can email us your question. The address is questions at thewalrus.ca. Again, that's questions at thewalrus.ca. Women leaders right now are at the forefront of public health and they have been thrust into the spotlight with our current health crisis. I see them as rock stars. And as we collectively navigate the COVID-19 pandemic, we're putting our trust in these leaders to adapt and guide us through a time of great uncertainty. It has quickly become imperative for political leaders to demonstrate their values while putting aside any partisan differences in order to act in the best interest in the community at large. Today, we have the unique opportunity to hear from Dr. Dina Hinshaw, the Chief Medical Officer for the province of Alberta. And she will share with us her approach to leadership, as well as the principles that have been guiding her through the pandemic. Now to introduce our special guest is a pretty special woman herself, and she's a longtime friend of the Walrus, She's also the Senior Vice President for Corporate Affairs and Human Resources for Husky, Janet Annesley. Welcome, Janet. Thanks, Jennifer. COVID-19 has been an unwelcome and persistent intruder in all of our lives. It has forced us apart, but it's also brought us together to work more collaboratively as communities. Our community leaders have tackled the often thankless job of marshalling resources, explaining evolving science, putting in place the safeguards to help us navigate the new normal, and many of those at the forefront of this leadership are women. At Husky, we are doing our part to support the success of women in leadership, having recently announced the target of having 25% women in senior leadership roles. It's not a quota system. To be clear, it's not even a big stretch given the talent in our organization and indeed all around us. And certainly the woman at the forefront of Alberta's pandemic response, Dr. Hinshaw, has made a strong impression on all of us at Husky and indeed on all Albertans. Her Alberta roots are strong, having grown up in Sylvan Lake and later completing her medical degree at University of Alberta. She was appointed Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health in 2019. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you today, Dr. Henshaw.
you so much for the honor of this invitation. I'm very pleased to be able to be here today as a part of the speaker series. I am, as you likely know, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, Chief Medical Officer of Health in Alberta, and I was asked today to speak about my leadership experience in the pandemic, uh, my leadership style, making decisions in the context of incomplete information and evidence, uh, and about how public health has really come to the forefront through this pandemic experience. I want to speak about this through the lens of a phrase that you've heard many times, not just from me, but from others, about how our response has been framed, which is that we are all in this together. And I want to talk about this at the, the macro level, the high societal level, the meso level, how that works out in a team environment, and at a more personal level, that micro individual level. So starting with that macro level, one of the things that's really interesting about COVID-19 for me is that it has unmasked in a way that we truly are all in this together, which is to say that we have certain uh, elements of how we live together, how our societies are organized, uh, that often tend to be hidden, that we don't see or that uh, we might prefer not to see. And COVID-19 has really lifted uh, a veil in some ways by reminding us that those who have perhaps precarious work or work that uh, they don't have the ability to do from home are those who are more likely to be exposed. And we've seen that in some of our larger workplace outbreaks and in some of our um, trends of who the individuals are who are more, again, likely to be put in that path. Uh, we've also seen what I think is interesting about COVID that when we have an infectious disease that can spread from person to person, we can see that interconnection of the, the phrase of six degrees of separation, which can often be kind of an interesting party trick or party game where you get together and talk about who you know and try to find those connections. COVID-19 shows how that's a, a challenge in a time of infectious diseases where I can spread, if I get COVID, that illness to those in my circle who spread it to those in their circle, and quite quickly it can spread rapidly. So again, it really showcases how we have to work together to be successful against COVID. Another thing about this virus that is challenging is the fact that many people who get infected have a relatively mild course of disease. And while that is a good thing, the challenge comes in the fact that people may be less motivated to take measures if they believe, potentially rightly, that they will only have a mild course of illness. And so there's less of an individual preservation motivation, uh, and there has to be more of that collective effort because the only way we can protect those who are at highest risk is truly by making sure that all of us every day are thinking about our actions, not just for ourselves, but for those around us as well. It's uh, a commonly uh, held understanding in the neuroscience world that our brains are actually social organs, that we function in a network of other humans, that we are connected to the people around us in a very tangible biological way, that our brain actually changes physically based on the interactions that we have with people how other people respond to us and how we respond to them. And it's that element uh, that's embedded both in our neuroscience, our brain development, also in that interaction as infectious disease can spread from one to another. All of those things, again, to me, showcase that we as humans are not just individuals. We live in a network of people and also we are inextricably connected to our environments. And again, COVID-19 shows us how we're connected to our uh, plant environment, animal environment, and the ways that we interact with that non-human element of our environment also has impacts on our health individually and collectively. So with all of these kinds of um, issues being show, shown to us by COVID, it really, again, highlights that our only way forward, our best way forward, is to be all in this together. The final point I want to make at that macro level is that with any kind of crisis, there will always be a divergence of opinion. And particularly in a, in a time when evidence is incomplete and rapidly emerging, so evidence shifts and changes based on 
uh, what research has been done, what um, the most recent understanding is. Our best way of making decisions in that kind of rapid emerging evidence context is to take the best of what we have that science can give us and then put it into a context where we bring diverse perspectives together because we need to understand multiple different aspects of a response to a crisis in order to make the best possible decision. So we are all in this together biologically, we are all in this together mentally, we are all in this together from a decision-making standpoint where, uh, again, taking into account those different aspects will help us move forward more effectively. At the MISO level, the, that concept of those different perspectives translates really naturally into that team environment. And in my work in the ministry, I work with a, a policy team within the bureaucracy of the government, within the department. And of course, I also work by providing advice to elected officials. And in both of those contexts, again, it's so critical that there isn't just one person who has all the answers, that we all come together from our backgrounds, our experiences, that we bring what we have to offer together and work through these really difficult, sometimes messy decisions as a group. We are often challenged by the time that we have available to us. And so part of that decision-making process involves working towards inter interacting and uh, taking into account all those different perspectives, but also then ultimately really needing to move forward quickly. So trying to find that balance, doing the best we can to integrate perspectives and make prompt and effective decisions, and then evaluate them based on what we understand from additional evidence from our own experience. And in a, in a crisis, we have to be able to be flexible to make decisions based on what we know, continue to assess and gather evidence, and then adjust those decisions so we can continually respond in our best way possible. At that team level, again, to me, as one of the leaders, there are many leaders on our teams, but as one of the leaders in that team environment, it's so important to me that people are supported to show up as who they are, where their backgrounds are, uh, and that they are able to take time to recharge, to re-energize, uh, and you know, be with their families outside of this particular response. We've heard a lot that it's a marathon, not a sprint, but I kind of feel like we are sprinting a marathon, which can get tiring at times. And so as much as possible, I personally, in, in my part, have tried hard to support the team, encourage the members of the team when we've hit certain milestones, uh, using, using humor to manage situations and remind people that this is hard, uh, acknowledging it's difficult, but also trying to uh, bring our attention to the points of light and the points of hope in, in this response, uh, acknowledging and thanking people for their work. And again, that, that concept of we have to be in this together as a team. We can't point fingers at an individual if something goes wrong. We need to be thinking of the system. And instead of, of pointing back about, well, what happened and who's to blame, pointing forward about what happened and how do we make it better going forward? Because again, that is our, our best approach. Now, moving from, again, that, that meso level, one of the things that has been the hardest for me, I will say, in this response is translating that effort to support and care for the team members, making sure they get a break and a rest into my own life. And some of the challenges as a leader, wanting to be there for everyone, wanting to be there for the team, wanting to be there for the public, uh, wanting to take on challenges, help people solve problems, uh, and it's very hard to step away and to be okay with disconnecting and letting others uh, carry the load for a while because I feel very responsible. Uh, but at the end of the day, I need to be a part of that. We are all in this together. That includes being able to show myself the same compassion and kindness that I want to show to other people consistently. And so one of the things that, that I've been working on, one of my development opportunities in this pandemic, is making sure that when I say we are all in this together, that I am a part of that, as all of my team are, my family, and then that broader society. Because um, it's really important that in my role, 
I'm able to acknowledge and hear the voices that uh, articulate some of the challenges with our response, uh, some of the impacts that our COVID control measures have had. And it's, it's hard because I never want to be responsible or I never want to um, uh, cause harm to other people. So I will take responsibility if I have done that, but I, I, I never ever want to be in a position where I am causing harm. That's the last thing in the world that I want to do. Uh, and so when I, when I hear from people of some of the challenges, and I'll use the example of our continuing care visitor restriction policy, we heard so many examples of the suffering and the anguish of residents in those facilities, of their family members where they weren't able to be together. They weren't able to uh, have those interactions that are such a necessary part of all of our human experience of that interconnectedness with people. And so I needed to hear that. I needed to hear the, the challenges that our policy had put in place and to be able to uh, take that on and find that way forward, find a way to ease our restrictions while at the same time protecting those individuals in those care centers who are the most vulnerable to severe outcomes from COVID and finding a way to again hold both of those tensions, protecting from COVID and making sure that there was the ability to have that close interaction with loved ones. And so a part of the role I find is that if I am not being self-compassionate, if I am not taking that time to recharge and connect with my own family and, uh, you know, again, uh, sometimes connecting with my own family isn't the easiest thing in the world when I get home after a long day and my children are quite understandably frustrated at the fact they haven't seen me much uh, and they're reacting in ways that are totally understandable, but again, can be hard where I feel like I'm carrying burdens all day at work and then I come home and carry burdens at home. Uh, but if I'm not able to be kind and compassionate to myself, uh, acknowledging I've made mistakes, I will make more, then it's actually harder for me to do my job. It's harder for me to show that care and compassion to others, to my family, to my team, uh, and to, again, the, the broader population. And so that's something that I strive to do. I strive to let go of the, the guilt that comes when I feel like I can't be all things to all people. Uh, but ultimately, I know in my head that uh, if I'm able to do this better as time goes on, that I will be better able to serve in my role uh, and to those others in my personal life to whom I have uh, responsibilities and, and whom I, I dearly love and, and want to be there for. So I hope that that helps a little bit articulate my approach and some of the challenges and learnings through the pandemic. Uh, but ultimately, we, we truly need to be in this together uh, and continue to work every day to pick up from where we left off, uh, do our best that day, uh, learn from our mistakes, and then do the same the next day because COVID will be with us for many months to come. Uh, and so it's uh, the, the opportunities are there to, to continue to learn through that process. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak and uh, again, really appreciate the, the honor of being asked. Thank you so much, Dr. Hinshaw. Really excited to get into the Q&A. And I have to start by saying that I'm always impressed how cool, calm, collected you are. And I notice people often describe you as that. A lot of us want to run around right now going, ah, <laughs> because of COVID. So how do you maintain that composure, especially during such a stressful time for all of us, but especially in your line of work? You know, I, I guess um, part of it is, is my inclination. You know, I, I have my whole life sort of been described as someone who's fairly even keeled in terms of temperament. But uh, for me, the other part is, and especially when, when there are challenges happening or there's a particular topic, you know, right now there's a lot of attention on schools and there's a lot of concern uh, about school safety with respect to COVID. And I think one of the things that really helps me is trying to continually, intentionally be thinking about that bigger picture uh, and to be thinking about the fact that 
COVID is a significant threat that we need to be concerned about, and it is also not the only threat. And so trying always to be considering how that response, how, how we continually evolve our response um, is uh, part of, again, that, that bigger moving together as human beings in our environment and, and trying to find the best combination of paths. But if we drill down into kind of one specific thing and, and let that one specific topic uh, take over, I think that's unfortunately sometimes where that perspective of, you know, this is a, a bigger issue, a bigger picture, and get lost. So that, rightly or wrongly, that's that's sort of what keeps me in that um, bigger picture mentality is trying to really be intentional about thinking, how is this fit in with all the other things that we have to deal with every day? So zoom out and keep in mind all the other things <laughs> and not get overwhelmed by that either. Yeah, that's, that's true. You, right? <laughs> We have a question from Megan. What resources, books, humans, mental models have you drawn on in this period? Um, so many different ones, I would say. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, my my family and friends have been amazing. And, you know, my sister who texts me a couple times a week just to tell me that, you know, she loves me or, you know, my mom or my husband, my my kids I think that's really again in terms of that bigger picture remembering that even though the role is important and the roles of others I work with are important um, that's not the only thing there's that kind of bigger connection in terms of books or mental models I would say I really appreciate the work of Brene Brown and uh, her book dare to lead in terms of a, a leadership frame I have found very helpful and have drawn on that. And uh, for me personally, I find my own faith tradition to be really meaningful. And so, you know, my own faith leaders have also helped me uh, to stay grounded in that big picture. Again, that, you know, being part of a, of a common humanity. And, and in fact, one of, the, um, one of the things that most recently I've been uh, really um, helped by is this model that, that uh, was written as a, a reflection by a, a Sikh activist. I'm sorry, I don't have the, the name right now of the individual, but she wrote about how in times of, of, tr of transition, it's like childbirth. And so um, there's that period in childbirth where uh, it's the, she calls it the most dangerous, but also the most productive, where you're close to the end, you're close to giving birth to new life. And it feels like dying because it is so hard and it is so painful. And so being able to be aware that there are days that are very hard and very painful in a transition of uh, what came before COVID to what comes after and being thoughtful about how staying grounded and, and in her words, the you know, finding that wise woman within um, to, to move through that painful process to be able to stay present uh, and not give up because it's hard or painful, but to be able to stick with it and, um, you know, give my, my best to the best possible future. And that heart can be good, right? Even though it's difficult yeah. in the moment, it's some of the best things are both hard and, and good. This one is from Patty. Patty asks, do you believe women's leadership traits will be better recognized and value, valued by all genders going forward due to the COVID crisis? I mean, we're talking about women's leadership right now and shining the spotlight on you. Uh, do, you do you think that we'll be able to recognize and value some of those, those traits? I think that, that did, there was conversation about that pre COVID and uh, obviously that that continues as there are many powerful women leaders through this COVID response. Um, I think that there has been a recognition that I've seen in in some of the public commentary about the the power of um, bringing compassion to leadership and and my preferred future would be that uh, that we really empower people of all genders to to show up with those leadership traits and not to, um, uh, I think sometimes we, we, as a society, can downplay those traits uh, in our boys and our young men. And, and as a mother of boys, I, I want, you know, my, 
my kids and also, you know, our, our, our daughters and our sons should be empowered to um, embrace those traits that, that make us powerful leaders of, uh, again, kind of bringing out the best in the team, bringing in compassion and, and kind of making us explicitly more than the sum of our parts. So I hope so, I guess that would be the short mm -hmm. answer. Um, and, and I think that there's lots of opportunities to continue to highlight how um, those kinds of qualities are important for, for people of all genders to really hone in our, our leadership roles. So we have to talk about the dress. <laughs> the periodic table dress for those who haven't seen it. A friend of mine is a high school science teacher and she saw it and she tracked it down. It was sold out and was sold out, but she got her hands on it because it inspired her and she wants to wear it and be a role model for her students. But I was thinking about it and I thought, wow, would I ask a male doctor about his fashion, his clothes, but to your point, why not? I love fashion, you love fashion, let's talk about it. You know, it's part of the leadership. Tell me about the response you got to that dress and, and what, what you think it said. <laughs> I, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I've had that dress for, for a long time and uh, it, it has always been actually my favorite dress because it, it brings together my undergrad was in chemistry and, you know, I, I really love that kind of science um, element. And, and so the, the thing I loved about that dress was that it did bring together science and, and fashion uh, in a really fun way. So I, I did not expect the uh, the attention <laughs> that the dress got, uh, but I think what it says is, um, it, you know, part of part of the response. There's so much that's serious and hard about the COVID response, but part of it uh, is also about finding joy where we identify it and finding the things that can be interesting and fun, and and so that that pairing of what's traditionally a very um, to some may be seen as a dry or technical um, symbol with something that's, that's fashionable and, and fun. I think it, it really symbolizes or has come to symbolize for many people um, the, the power of pairing the kind of science and a joy in science, kind of taking it into that creative realm in a, a bit of a different way. So yeah, it, it, uh, it was unexpected and a bit overwhelming, but, uh, but again, I think symbolizes a lot of what is really great about the um, ability of uh, many leaders around the world to bring together science and that element of creativity and, and really seeking out uh, interesting ways of addressing some of the challenges that COVID has brought. Yeah, and we see that in this discussion with moving STEM to STEAM, putting the A in there for arts, right? So mm -hmm. much taps into that. We have a question from uh, Francis actually on science. Francis says, thanks for being an outstanding leader. How do you balance societal needs and science? That is a critical question. And I think that, um, you know, I, I do sometimes certainly I recently have had a lot of, of media questions about uh, you know, political interference. And, and what I would say is that my role is structured to provide the best scientific advice with my best understanding of how that meets societal needs. But in a, a democracy with elected officials, really it's a partnership because our elected officials are the people who the population have said, we trust you to represent our values and bring those forward. Um, and so when I was talking earlier about the importance of taking all perspectives into account, you know, in public health, a really foundational aspect of public health is equity and is bringing forward considerations for broader good, not just, um, not just thinking about the uh, issues that are good for the majority, but who are the silent minority or, or who are those who might be left behind and trying to bring those voices to the table. But ultimately in decision making, those, those values that the elected officials bring to the table need to be a part of that conversation. So, you know, again, I think it's, it's exactly how we're meant to function is um, with that debate, you know, the, the model of, of governance in Alberta and Canada is about debate and bringing different voices together and then trying to find the best path forward. And so as I bring my advice forward, uh, that's what I try to do is think about evidence and explicitly think about those 
whose voices might not typically be heard or who might not typically be um, able to access uh, power and, and how do I bring those voices forward? And then again, ultimately the, the collective and, the, and that discussion brings out the final decision. Well, on that note, you touched on it earlier in your, your keynote address as well. We have the COVID pandemic, and then what has also been described as a pandemic is anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism. And I'd love to know how the social determinants of health inform your work as a doctor, but also our understanding of, of COVID. Yeah, I mean, I, and again, I think COVID has really unmasked um, some of that inequity that that tends to be um, perhaps things that we, we it's inconvenient to uh, to recognize, but we're, we're really, COVID shines a light on some of those things. Um, and I think that with respect to the, the issues of racism um, and even, you know, the issues of who's going to be impacted by the significant economic repercussions of COVID, and differential impacts on women, differential impacts on uh, racialized communities, people who are newcomers, uh, young people. There's, there's the, the impacts, whether it's impacts of COVID or anything else, are never equally distributed. And so uh, I guess in terms of my work as a, as a public health physician and my work in this pandemic, um, what I try to do, and again, it, it, <laughs> especially uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were, we were moving so, so quickly. And uh, you know, many of the policy decisions that were being made and, and the movement to respond to the significant threat uh, that was being seen in other countries around the world uh, and, the, and the need to respond quickly to avoid that same kind of impact of magnitude in Alberta, mm -hmm. we didn't always, in fact, we didn't have time to do that robust policy analysis and things that, you know, fairly major decisions that would typically not happen without months of debate really needed to be moved very quickly because of the, the serious consequences of a delay in action. Um, I did try at that time and, and still try to think about those elements of um, who is going to be differentially impacted by this and how can we try to minimize that impact or um, you know, think about ways that we work together with other levels of government to provide supports that are needed. And even something, it's not simple, but something as simple as income support for those who are feeling symptomatic or who are close contacts of COVID cases. Not everyone has sick leave from their jobs. And again, those who are most um, perhaps precariously employed, uh, who may not be able to afford to take 10 days off of work because they're sick, especially if it's a mild illness for them. Um, how do we support those individuals for their own benefit and for the benefit of all of us? I really think again, um, that trying to articulate the benefits of some of the, the policies that we've put in place, it's not just about the individual who benefits from that particular policy, but how it really supports this overall response that, that prevents a broader societal impact. Well, a question that relates, this is from Joanne. What can the corporate world do to ensure women don't continue to be disproportionately impacted by the pandemic? Is there something for folks, you know, who are working in business that they can do? I think there's two things. One is maybe more immediate and the other is, is broader. And I'll, I'll start with the broader one first, which is to say that uh, the, the kinds of things that many people have been talking about for a long time about looking at um, you know, how we structure our, our society, uh, education, employment, um, that for various reasons, women uh, typically have, uh, not, not always obviously, but, but they're uh, overrepresented perhaps in um, uh, maybe less um, secure jobs. Uh, and, and that's partly because again, Many times women will leave a job for a while when they have a child. If they don't have a child still, there's assumptions about women in leadership positions and what they can or can't achieve. 
And I think that those broader societal pieces are things we just need to keep chipping away at. And that will always be true in COVID or out of COVID. But ultimately, the, the more resilient a society we have, the more we are able to support uh, women, the more we're able to support newcomers to Canada, to Alberta, uh, the more we're able to support different racialized communities who are overrepresented in um, the uh, those who are perhaps uh, in a lower income side of things, the more we can do that systematically, not just in COVID, but all the time, the better able we're, we're going to be um, prepared to respond to any crisis. I think with respect to COVID specifically, you know, again, there's these issues of, of who cares for children, who cares for aging parents, perhaps, and some of the extra burdens that COVID has put upon um, those who are in those caregiving roles. And so I think in terms of the corporate world, and again, I would say that, that this may help women, but men as well, is to be thinking about what are the policies that can be put in place um, to support people who do have that kind of extra uh, responsibility or burden that COVID may exacerbate. Uh, and there may be, for example, a child or a household member who has a chronic condition that may mean that someone, some families aren't sending their children to school in person. So is it possible for individuals to work from home or, or find other ways to support people who, who do have an extra burden because of COVID to do things in a little bit of a different way. And so I think the more flexible that companies can be to be working with employees to find solutions that um, can work for everyone, I think the better off we'll all be. And we have seen the culture shift in regards to adapting to kids being at home, not for all jobs, uh, but definitely for some jobs. So uh, I think there's some, some examples and, and, and work that we can build on, but absolutely there's a lot of workplace policies uh, that can be put in place to build on this work. All right, a couple more questions from the audience and thanks to everyone who's sending these uh, in. From Deborah, how do we cultivate the importance of social good in the context of changing vaccine hesitancy, which seems to be emerging? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, it's a critical question. And I think the topic of vaccines um, has become fraught over the last uh, little while. I mean, I, there certainly has been uh, vaccine hesitancy since the 1800s when the first vaccine was produced, you know, some of the concerns that are voiced today were voiced, you know, well over 100 years ago, um, just because when we give a vaccine, we're giving something to a person who's healthy to protect them from becoming sick. And so there's a different standard that we need to hold that uh, intervention to than if someone who is sick and gets a treatment um, I think people are willing to take on a little bit more risk of, of receiving something external to them uh, when, when they're sick and want to get better. And so I think for, with vaccines, unfortunately, um, I think there's uh, a great many layers of the reasons why people are reluctant to, to take on vaccines. And I think with COVID in particular, and some of the narratives and some of the choices that are being made about vaccines around the world and, and moving them very, very quickly. You know, I think that we need to be sure that a vaccine is safe before we offer it to the population, uh, because ultimately at the bottom of the, the vaccine decision that any individual makes is trust. It, you know, trust that this is going to, uh, this intervention will do, uh, will protect the person who's receiving it and will protect those around them. And I think back to that point about the social good, ultimately a, vac a choice to vaccinate is not just for that individual. And it goes back to what I was saying about COVID being a relatively mild disease. And so what, what I've been trying to underline, and I think that hopefully resonates with some, is that we can't just make decisions that are good for ourselves in this pandemic. We do need to think about the impacts of our decisions on other people. And so right now what that means is the choices to stay home if we're sick, choices to continually observe social distancing, physical distancing, um, wearing masks when that's not possible, some of those individual choices that protect the people around us. And when a, a safe and effective vaccine is available, then I think the, the choice of protecting those around us does extend to that choice to vaccinate as well. But I think there's a huge responsibility on um, decision makers to make sure that every single step that needs to be followed is followed 
before that vaccine is made available because uh, and this is true for all of our vaccines. We need rigorous safety processes and, and we have those in place and we need to make sure we follow those for COVID vaccines, uh, which again is being done because uh, it's so critical um, that the people who are choosing whether or not to take vaccine know that every, every step is being taken to make sure that those are safe and that when they choose to do something for the social good, uh, that they're not putting themselves in harm's way to do that. Yeah, this is very much a larger story of us, isn't it? In, in the questions, like you were saying before, we are all in this together. A follow-up question here from Nanaba. What is it about Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead, that speaks to you? Uh, so I, I've read most of, of her work, and I think that there's that common theme that runs through all of her work of the importance of um, honesty, the importance of, of vulnerability, and uh, the, the importance, uh, how, how vulnerability and courage are intertwined. You know, I love the, the story she shares about speaking with army colonels or, you know, commanders who've been in firefights and, and asking them about courage and vulnerability and how they're inextricably connected and, and where we might think a, a very typically or stereotypically kind of um, macho environment in an, an army where you don't show weakness, you don't show fear. And yet when those individuals are reflecting on it, actually it's, it's courage requires that vulnerability and being honest with oneself. And I, I think what I really, what really resonates with me about her book on leadership is the importance of as a leader also being vulnerable and also being open to honest feedback from the people on the team, um, coming alongside people. So she has a section in that book on giving feedback and talks about very, very basic things like come alongside a person, sit next to them, not across the desk. Think about what the common goal is and, and see it as moving um, to a common end rather than as a confrontation. And I you know, some of that, some of that's really hard because there's always power dynamics in leadership. And sometimes those power dynamics can feel uh, like a protective layer for the leader to kind of have that hierarchy. And I think what I, what I really appreciate about her book is it challenges that and says, you know, in order to really um, come together as a really effective team, uh, if you are able to have people show up with their whole selves, um, then you're going to achieve the best of what you can as a team. People aren't going to be keeping part of themselves back or not mentioning something because they're afraid that they're going to be called out. So, uh, you know, I think those are the pieces about her book that, that I find really helpful. And, you know, one of the things actually that reminds me of when you asked earlier about different models, uh, one of the things that I have found really helpful in parenting, um, and I've read, I don't even know how many different parenting books, but much of what I've learned being a parent, which is incredibly hard, I will just say that being a parent is the hardest thing I've ever done because it does require me to um, be humble and to not know the answers and to just do the best I can. Your kids do not care that you're Dr. Dina Hinshaw. <laughs> they do not care, one whit, they, uh, they really don't. <laughs> Um, and that's great, actually. But but a lot of the parenting books that I've read are really applicable to all situations about being open to different perspectives, allowing people to be in an emotional response. It's okay to feel things. We need to make choices about how we express that. But a lot of those things actually are applicable to team environments, to leadership, to interacting with, with uh, others because ultimately we grow up, but we, we still have emotions, you know, we, we get better at maybe hiding them, but I'm not sure that, uh, that we're, certainly I will say for myself, just that just because I'm an adult doesn't mean that, that I'm always really good at managing my emotional responses to things. And so parenting means that I get another opportunity to think about what, do, what am I asking my kids to do? And am I doing that? Am I modeling that? Um, and, and, some of that shows up in team dynamics as well. Yeah, well, on that note, back to school has been a particularly stressful time for parents and students with COVID-19. And I know there's been some confusion around physical distancing and masks, even timing of announcements. You got a lot of feedback. 
what did you learn from the feedback that you received, especially from other parents? You know, and I will say I'm still receiving that feedback. And, and I know that as parents, we want the absolute best for our kids and um, we don't want to put them in harm's way. Uh, and so I, I think that some of the things that have been made abundantly clear to me, uh, first of all, is that giving as much advance notice as possible uh, is ideal. And so as you referenced, uh, we did release uh, an order on a weekend before school started, which restated what had already been in our guidelines, but was a, a different legal tool to be able to put in the hands of, of um, school authorities. And, uh, you know, of course, um, if you'd asked me the week before, what's the best timing, I would have said as soon as possible. So it, you know, it wasn't necessarily a choice to do it that way, but I do think that it really highlighted that, that uh, we and I had not been effective at communicating what that framework was because it seemed to land as a surprise to many people. So what it really showcased to me was the importance of um, over communicating in as many different channels as possible, especially because I heard from parents, some parents saying, well, if I'd known that that was the framework, I wouldn't have sent my child back to school. I would have chosen the online option and it's too late. And so, you know, I think again, um, it's something always really important for me to remember that just because we've put something online or I've said it once in a media availability doesn't mean that's adequately been communicated. And so, uh, we really, really need to be over communicating, you know, in multiple forums, through multiple channels, using multiple partners to make sure that our frame and our messaging is really, really clear so that people understand when they're making decisions what that frame is. So I, I think that's one, one thing. Uh, the other thing that I'm still um, really working on is to try to understand, you know, and again, as a parent myself, trying to understand how how do we as parents integrate the risks of COVID into the larger risks that our children face every day? And, you know, when I was a, a mother of very young kids trying to manage things and, and learning about parenting at the same time, um, my two are climbers. You know, they, they go vertical at the drop of a hat and, and coming from a background of public health and injury prevention, it was terrifying to see them scale these heights. And I really had to figure out how do I manage this risk? And how do I figure out how to let them learn and explore and test their limits and develop their skills when they, they have these, um, I don't even know, proclivities for climbing um, without putting them in harm's way. And so, you know, at first I just thought, well, I'll just tell them to stay down, you know, don't go, don't climb. <laughs> but it became quickly apparent unless I was going to strap them to my leg and, and uh, not let them loose, I, I could not stop them from climbing. So I really relied on, uh, and, and again, this isn't right for everyone. I think parenting is challenging because there is no one right path, but I really relied on, on encouraging them to listen to your body, listen to what your body's telling you. Does your body tell you it's safe? Does, like, how, does your, how do you feel about where you are? The precariousness or non of where you are and of thinking about um, really encouraging them to use their own intuition and managing that risk and I think with COVID it's so new it's unknown it's infectious there are very small risks of some serious outcomes for children like the multi-system inflammatory condition um, it, it's so hard we would so much rather I think uh, protect our children from these mysterious risks uh, when in fact the risks of a car crash causing them injury or the risks of them falling off the playground and breaking an arm or you know some of these things that we have integrated into our lives and our abilities to manage um, the possible risks have, have those have been there from the moment that our children were born we've been having to manage all these other risks all along and trying to then figure out how do you integrate COVID into that? This new thing where we don't even have answers to yeah. all our questions. I think that, that, that I find is the hardest part is even when we think we know COVID, there's something yeah. discovered about it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so, so hard. Um, and yet at the same time, if we only make decisions about COVID risk, we are exposing our children to other risks. 
uh, risks of missing out on things. And again, for some families, that's completely reasonable and appropriate. We all need to make our own decisions. But that's been a very difficult thing to try to figure out how do we how do we communicate that? How do how do I um, how can I be most helpful as people work through this in their own families, with their own frameworks, with their own risk tolerances? I can't make that decision for them, but how can I provide useful information to help integrate those risks into the risks we face every single day when our children leave the house to go to school? And Dr. Hinshaw, that comes back to a theme I'm hearing throughout our conversation of balance. Um, right, that, that, that's where the work is. We have a few minutes left. Um, this is an audience question. Sometimes we hear the few negative voices loudly when people criticize our decisions. Do you feel the community support? <laughs> well, you know, again, I think it's a, it's a very um, uh, well-known fact that, that our, our brains uh, absorb the negative much more than the positive. And uh, I think that has been a, certainly a challenge for me because I do get um, people who are very, very angry. And so, you know, as I said earlier, what I strive to be able to do is to hear the motivation for that. So whether or not the, the accusations are true, when people are angry or scared, something is driving them. And, and as a, a person in a leadership role during a time of crisis, inevitably there's an association that people have with me and COVID, everything that comes with COVID. So, so I try very hard to um, uh, take the, feel compassion for the suffering that people are having to be able to um, not internalize the accusations about, you know, me being solely responsible for every bad thing that's happened in Alberta since March, which has been said repeatedly. Mm -hmm. I, but also to, to say, well, people, people, you know, need to be able to, to vent and hopefully do that in a way that's not disrespectful. But, uh, but I also know that um, there are others who have expressed their gratitude and, and I've been uh, so touched by, by some of the emails that I've received, um, some letters and cards that I've received. Uh, people have taken the time to write and, and say what they've appreciated and, and that has meant so much to me. Uh, and the, the feedback, of course, from, from my team and from my family. And so ultimately that's the, that's another one of the, the Brene Brown kind of suggestions is you have your four square, you know, you write on your little piece of paper whose opinions matter. Um, to be able to, to recognize the validity or the, um, everyone has their own perspective, but this little, this little square of paper, the people whose opinions really matter to me. Uh, and so being able to, to hold on to that. And, and ultimately, again, kind of going back to that point about compassion, knowing that um, uh, just as I would wish to express compassion to everyone else, that I need to be able to do that for myself. And, and that's been really important to, to practice. Well, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health, there have been lots of messages coming in throughout our conversation about how inspiring you are and offering lots of thanks. So I just want to pass that on. And thank you so much for joining us today. You have been so honest and quite vulnerable with us and given us a lot to reflect on, not just on, on COVID and, and leadership, but the full lives that we're all trying to give. Thank you so much again. Well, thank you for the invitation. Great, and I wanna thank everyone who submitted questions. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Honorable Lois E. Mitchell, immediate past Lieutenant Governor of Alberta. Alberta, her honor is a longstanding supporter, a good friend of the war, so we're so pleased that you were able to uh, join us today. We're also joined by members of the Walrus Trust. The Walrus Trust, these are leaders in our community, community and they secure the future of the walrus with significant multi-year uh, philanthropic commitment. So thank you to Di Diane Blake and Janelle Assange who are here with us. And thanks to all the supporters and community members of the Walrus who joined us today. You power our work. 
Thank you again to Janet and everyone at Husky, as well as our partners at Shaw. Shaw is one of our national partners, along with Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, and Air Canada. And we want to stay in touch with all of you. So this is how it's going to work. You're going to receive a follow-up email. And if you would like to attend more events like this one, please opt into our newsletter. We needed to do that so we can stay in touch and also consider being a donor. Uh, wow, lots to think about again today. Thank you so much. Merci, miigwech, and have a good day.